Hello everyone. I am going to do a video for you in um, showing you how to plan your soapstone carving piece from um, just an odd shaped piece of stone. I usually start with a drawing. Um, it may be something I've gleaned off the free internet photos and images that I usually just make a line drawing of. I find line drawings are the simplest um, thing that we can use as a tool to get the basic outline and shape of what you're trying to create. I, the photos themselves are, have too much detail or are hard to see the dips and valleys that you need to see on uh, the piece. And I usually start out with trying to create the image in the size that I want so that I have a really good visual and whether it's going to fit into the piece of stone that I have chosen. Um, I try and use as much of the stone as I can so there's less wastage. Um, this, so that also means that the stone has to have kind of the same shape as what I'm trying to create. So I will choose my soapstone pieces based on the positioning of the animal that I'm going to carve, uh, trying to make the most of all of the stone that's there and create less work for me to remove the stone that I don't want. This particular one I'm going to do on a base. So I've drawn a line along the bottom right now to sort of simulate the base and I've pretty much recre recre recreated this line drawing on the stone. The next steps are to actually draw on all sides of the stone. So you've got the left, the right, the front, the back and the top. So five sides that you need to consider and draw that same drawing with the same dimensions of the same size on all sides. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I've done this one. I'm gonna just maybe outline it a bit darker. I use a, what they call a China marker, which is a wax pencil. And I found that it's the best. I've gone through trying to use uh, felt markers, which just dry up with the dust of the stone. Um, pencils usually aren't dark enough or maybe wide enough. Uh, so I've found that the China markers are the best and you can get, usually get them at your staple store, your stationery store in black or red. It's important to make sure that you note all the small little pieces that you need to save as well and don't lose those in your carving. Um, you might want to also just draw on the big side so that you always have room to take it down in scale when you're doing your your finer details. So carve big within the stone, less wastage, a larger piece and gives you room to scale it down rather than trying to go uh, directly to the size that you want initially. It's all about moving about your piece, doing this side, that side, front to back, making sure that the piece comes together. And I'm just going to go ahead and draw the top as well. So looking at the drawing and knowing that I'm going to put him in and I might be turning his face because my stone is pointed on this end. That Again, this is the top, so I may have to actually curve him to get the head in more in that area. So I'm trying to correlate where definitive areas are. I've drawn a circle for the hump so that I know that is in line with this. I've drawn the back of the body in the same place. And where the shoulders coming in is about here to here and here to there. And then the head goes out into this longer area here. Turning it around, I'm going to reverse the drawing and do this, try to keep the same heights of things, the same length, and just basically have a good idea that this particular position is going to fit 
on this particular stone so that I'm not having to make adjustments along the way. I'm trying to make sure that I um, don't have those problems later on. I can deal with them now and make sure. So I'm going on to the other side of the stone, which is not a cut side like this one where it was nice and flat to draw on. Now it's a fairly irregular and bumpy surface, but the same uh, rules apply. I want to try and make sure that we get the things that we have drawn already on either side at the same height down. So there's my hump. There's my nose. You can see on either side that they are joining up in the same area, same heights, carrying on. I have the, uh, the base running this line along here too. And you don't have to have a base, obviously. You could decide to um, just have this piece standing right on the ground. Um, that's preferable in some instances. And sometimes a base is nice just to ground the piece and give it uh, a bit more of a story, maybe in the type of terrain that he's on. So just, again, trying to get the basic shape Comparing back and forth all the time, making sure that the heights are the same as well as the positioning. That's the front foot. Now on this side, we know that we're going to have a shoulder and a foot. And it's a very basic outline for sure. Uh, I can see that this needs to come up a bit. I use a drywall grid. Um, it's drywall sandpaper. It comes in sheets. I like to use this as a rough sanding. It lasts a lot longer than any kind of sandpaper on the market. Sandpaper is generally on a paper surface. It just doesn't hold on, uh, hold its shape or its strength for very long. And I find that the drywall grid does. So head, neck, shoulders, hump, coordinating with the top of my drawing as well. And always looking from side to side to make sure that we're in the same place, ending up. Measuring with simple tools, just your pencil, where is that foot? Coming in, I can see right now that this one is maybe a bit too far back. Um, and what I can do is just block it off. Remember, carve big. So you can always take the foot back if you need to. And the measurements aren't going to be exactly the same because you have a flat surface here. And you have a round surface here, so if I measure this side, it is not going to exactly correlate to be exactly the same amount over on this side. What you want is to have basically the same drawing and make sure that the leg and foot placements are in the same place and the size and dimensions are the same. So remembering that this foot is forward on this side and the other foot on the this side is back, so there is some air space there. So it's probably going to be as far back as that. And we don't see it, right? We're going to just see the belly. And we may see just the bottom of the foot on this side. So we're going to make sure that we save that. When we get to the hind quarters, and I didn't really show you my the top of my drawing. So here's looking from the top area, the hind quarters, the belly, the shoulders and the hump, the neck and the head and nose. So I'm again correlating where this waist narrows on here so I can start the hips. The same for the shoulders and then coming around the back side of the stone. 
And you can see how much I will be taking off eventually when I start to carve. But I've kind of kept this, the shape uh, using as much of the stone as I can. So when I get to the back legs, I got to remember where where those legs are. And from this drawing, you can't really see. It looks like maybe the back feet are just um, side by side and the front legs are spread apart. So that's what I'm going to do for now. There might be a slight shift of one a bit more forward than the other. But again, if we draw big and carve big initially, then we can make those minor adjustments of putting one foot a little bit further ahead than the other. What's important on this particular drawing is that these two feet almost are, are together. There's no airspace here. Um, so it's going to be eventually rounded here, going into a valley there and coming out and rounding again for this leg. So as long as I get the length of the body putting in there, hopefully saving a bit of a, bit of a bump here now, for his tail, which will be in the center of the stone. I'm going to leave these legs for now. I'm pretty sure that it's going to be something like that on this side, but I think I'm going to need to be into the carving a bit more before I can really determine that. And here is the leg placement, the hump the neck and head. The drawing is definitely not perfect. It's very hard to do that when you have a very bumpy surface like this. And um, the whole idea is to carve a little bit, redraw, reorientate yourself as to where you are going with your carving, carve again, redraw if you need to. And eventually you can I find that I can stop the drawing because I can see the shape emerging anyways uh, and I'm making decisions along the way uh, as to whether the shape is changing or if I'm following the correct, uh, the drawing to be correct. And there's many a time where the drawing just gets tossed aside and you go with what's there. It might be because there's um, some kind of soft spot that you want to try and avoid in the stone or um, you've just made a change that's easier to do or you like the, the way something else is going. So it's very much a uh, customized as you go type of process. And really, and that's where the artistry comes in. This is your piece, you do it the way you want to um, and it just evolves with time. So the next step from here would be to actually start carving. I use uh, a Fordham grinder. It is a um, wood turning tool as well. There's different bits that you can get. You can see it's the size of my thumb and it it's very effective in carving soapstone. You do need to have uh, a full PPE. You need masks, filters, a Tyvek suit. It's extremely dusty and dirty. It's best done outside and you need to make sure that uh, your mask is fitted very well so that you are not uh, breathing in a lot of this dust. Um, obviously there's ways of doing this with uh, a mall hammer um, and mallet and chisel. Uh, it's just not the method that I tend to use. And you can also do this by hand with just the files and rifflers. Uh, nothing wrong with any of those methods, just whatever your preference is. Uh, the, the grinder is definitely a fast way to go. Uh, I also use uh, just uh, a smaller Dremel tool when I get further into the carving, when I need to get smaller areas done, smaller bits. Um, I tend to burn these out very quickly and they don't last that long. I've had to replace a few Fordham grinders as well. 
it's just because I think the dust is so hard on them and I often will cover them with a bit of pla a plastic bag um, as long as the unit can still breathe. It just helped keep some of the dust down. So the next stage, as I said, is about carving and I'm going to be set up outside to do that and I will hopefully have that video taped for you as well. Hi folks, I'm going to try and continue the carving of our polar bear soapstone sculpture. I've moved everything outside. It's still very snowy and icy here. I've had to move things about just so I can get, find some bare ground that I'm not going to slip on. And uh, I'll just explain to you what how I've set up my table to work outside. So I have my Fordham grinder here. This is a TXH Fordham grinder. Uh, filter masks, 3M P100. Uh, I usually put a Tyvek suit on and when I gear up I won't be talking on the video because uh, I obviously can't speak with my mask on. I'm going to also uh, show you that I have the foot pedal on the ground which is moist and I have a rubber mat down to protect myself. So hopefully this all goes well and I'll just try and stop the video and do an overlay of uh, explanations and we'll start carving a little bit. I did bring out a little resin example to help me with my drawing as well. It gives me something to focus on, something to refer to for confirmation and structure on the bear and we'll just go from there, see what happens. Hi and uh, welcome back. This is going to be um, the next portion of our carving where I am starting to uh, follow the outline that we have drawn on the top of the stonework, making that silhouette, the waist, the hips, etc. Um, just want to make sure that you understand that we, you can zoom in on the film where you need to once you're watching this. I uh, have geared up myself with my filter, my mask, my Tyvek. Definitely want to make sure you wear safety glasses as well when needed. Um, I have to admit I find it's troublesome sometimes because they fog up, uh, but that's definitely the way to go and some gloves on your hands as well. So keeping the stone in different positions um, and your tools moving around the stone, uh, it's important to be aware of what angle your rotary tool is being held in so that you're not cutting into some area that maybe is unseen for you. So you always just need to be aware of the angle of the tool and of your bit. Bracing the stone, using your body, to hold that stone in place so that it's not slipping around on you. Um, you don't want a lot of slippage, obviously, with the stone on the table, nor do you want to have, just as it happened there, have that rotary tool slipping off the stone. You always need to be aware of where the rest of your body is so that there is no uh, chance of having an accident of that tool slipping and catching your sleeve or your worse yet your arm your body parts um, just be very careful always to be aware of what's ahead and in front of your tool and the direction that you are going in So keeping in mind that as you're carving, you need to keep redrawing. Uh, you're going to be carving your marks off. So you carve, you redraw, you carve, or you redraw. I'm showing you the point of the head and the muzzle there. Um, I'm going to have to at some point go down to a smaller Dremel type tool to get in underneath the chin area. Um, 
you can see all of the dust blowing and that's always something to keep in mind too is if you can position yourself so that the wind is blowing the dust maybe away uh, and not back in your face as well that's always quite helpful so in this segment I'm cutting underneath the chin um, marking where the legs are to the belly undercutting the belly maybe going through to the other side eventually between the legs side to side from the belly and front to back taking the excess off the side so I did change my mind in my design I decided to go with putting the bear on the ground standing on the ground one back right leg on a, piece, a rock or a, a piece of ice just changing um, the position of the bear, putting some motion into the piece. Uh, he's not as stagnant then, not standing still. He's telling a story, showing some movement. I also changed to my Dremel tool just to get into those smaller spaces. So we're moving on uh, and just better defining the chin, under the chin, the ears, between the legs, the feet. And I'm going to be using my smaller Dremel tool. I like this one that has a smaller bit on it. It uh, just gets into lots of the crevices and corners much easier than the larger bit and uh, a little bit more maneuverable. Caution when using any kind of a Dremel a smaller bit. It's high, a higher speed, I believe. It seems to cut very quickly and very deeply and very easily. So um, you have to be very cautious with it. It's not does not leave a smoother area like the larger bit does. It just seems to cut deeper and you have to be very careful to uh, use a light touch with it. It can take off on you and um, it's just a little bit harder to manage even though it's getting into the areas that you want. So um, looking at the face you need to decide by drawing where those ears are going to be uh, in proportion to the eyes and the end of the nose and just finding the spots for them. Pushing the shoulders back maybe to create more length in the neck as well. Uh, but here I'm trying to focus now on the eye sockets, um, making those protrude. And again, with 3D sculpting, the only way to make something pop is to take away around that area, and that makes it pop because we can't add material on. We can only take away. So to make the eye sockets stand out more, we're going to narrow that muzzle and maybe the sides underneath around the eye socket so that they stand out more, creating a bit more shape to the muzzle, um, deciding the positioning of the ears, how low are they, how far back are they, making that space on the head uh, look appropriate to the face. And it's very important to stand back and look at your piece periodically, turn it around, look at all sides, all angles. It needs to gel, it needs to come together. You need to know that the feet are the right size for the body, that the legs are positioned in the right place horizontally, that the head is the right size for that body, that the neck is long enough, that the ears are small enough or big enough, all of those things. And it's very easy to uh, not see all of that when you're focusing closely on a piece. So you need to stand back, have a good look at it, and things will become evident when you get a, a better look from a distance, whether it's gelling, whether it's coming together, and um, you'll see areas that might need attention, the things that are working well and things that are not working well. One thing about the Dremel I wanted to mention too is that the direction that the bit is spinning makes a difference in the uh, 
ease of the stroke. So the direction of your stroke versus the direction of the drill bit, and you'll find that one direction is easier than the other because one, one way is biting into the stone and the other one is kind of skimming along the top. So you may want to use those strokes, different strokes at different times with uh, your Dremel and uh, you'll just find that it bites in a lot easier on one direction than it does the other. So here's our polar bear in the bathtub having a rinse before we go on to the sanding phase. You'll see that the water helps to see what the colors will be. We've got a very dark black uh, racing, racing stripe and some yellow brown stone. Uh, it really helps, the water really helps to have the color become evident what you're going to be seeing as you go through the sanding phase and the heat of the water will also intensify the colors a little bit as well. Once we get into the sanding, the 400 and 600 wet sanding, you're really just polishing and not changing the carving at all. Hi everyone, we're going to continue now with my polar bear using my hand tools, uh, rifflers we call them. I'm going to just explain a little bit about those. Uh, I really like these German made ones. They're very uh, hardy, long lasting, keep the tooth on them quite well, but you can certainly get other quality sets that I used in my classrooms a little bit, uh, usually not as fine, a little coarser. And um, these ones are going to give you the ability to get into corners with the points and so on and different shapes that can do different things for you triangular round flat and then different sizes as too you can get into the smaller uh, tools that just give you more flexibility in getting into smaller areas So here is my bear in uh, it's a tin roasting pan, about three inches deep. Uh, I just use water and my 400 wet sandpaper. Wet sandpaper is generally on a black paper. Helps you determine whether it is or not. You can't use the paper backed uh, dry sandpaper because it'll just fall apart when it does get wet. So you have to buy specifically paper that's meant to be wet and I generally just work in circular motions you might have to work a little harder on some of those spots remember this is where if you're working too hard with this sandpaper you need to go back dry this unit or the area go back to a, a coarser sandpaper there's no point in working for 20 minutes on something with the 400 if you can do it with a tool or with the sandpaper that's one grit back and this is where I think I told you you're polishing more than doing you're not certainly not carving and you're creating some mud with the dust and when you find that you're not creating much more dust then it's probably time to move on to the next sandpaper which would be 600 in this case I'm not going to be sanding the rock that's here. I'm going to just uh, make sure the tool marks and scratches are out and I'm going to just skim over it a little bit with sandpaper. I'm not going to oil it completely either. I'm going to just probably skim the oil over the top so that it's just um, showing some of the highlights of the rock, but it uh, separates the rock from, from the bear if it is not completely oiled, and I, I like that idea. Uh, you might see that I have put the tiniest little indentations for eyes and for the ears. I've put some toes in, just some lines to separate the toes. I tend to not put a lot of detail in for the, um, well, I even put a little bit of nose on there. I, but I tend to not put an awful lot. I don't try and do eyeballs, that sort of thing. It's more about using light and shadows to make suggestions of where things belong. And sculpture is all about using light, shadows,
putting movement into your piece and making it look good from all directions, all sides. And that should make for a good piece. So you can see now that I've completed one wet sanding with 400 wet sandpaper. Um, the colors are really starting to come out nicely now. It's a very yellow stone with this black brown area. There's lots of little black hard spicules in here. I don't think we'll ever get that feeling super smooth. Those black bits are just way, way too hard. And the more that you sand over them, you're not taking down the little black spots, but you are taking down the soapstone. And you end up making those little black spots actually pop out higher because you're removing the soapstone and not the black spots. So that's one, one sanding. I'm gonna go ahead and do the second one as well. Um, and I've probably spent about an hour and a half doing this one. So you can see, I think I said before, I often spend as much time sanding as I do carving. So if I spend an hour, an hour and a half on at least two sandings and then a third one usually goes a little bit faster, you still have uh, three, four hours at least in sanding as well. Um, you might notice I have a cloth on the bottom, a sponge in here. That's so I can lie this down without hopefully breaking off my ears and grit, you're removing the soapstone and there is grit in that. Oftentimes you will scratch your piece when you're laying it down to sand on it. So it's a good idea to either have a cloth or some paper towel, something at the bottom. Change your water as often as you need to. If there's a lot of grit in it, you don't want to be picking that up and putting it onto your piece and scratching it in. So lots of water, lots of rinsing.